Welcome everybody to this Facebook Live session where we explore the intersection between Christianity and science. My name is Dr. Fuzz Rana. I am a biochemist, I am a Christian apologist, and I'm also the Vice President of Research and Apologetics at an organization called Reasons to Believe. If you want to know more about our organization and the types of resources we have available for you to make use of as you explore the intersection between Christianity and science, go to our website, www.reasons.org. Today, we're going to take on this question. Were Neanderthals the very first hominins to make string? Uh, did Neanderthals have fiber technology? And of course, this question is part of a broader question, which deals with the cognitive abilities of Neanderthals compared to that of modern humans. Are human beings exceptional? Do we stand apart from other creatures? Are we different in kind? Or were creatures like Neanderthals like us? Did they have the same cognitive capacity as modern humans? Or were they cognitively inferior? And these questions form, again, a part of a broader question still, and that has to do with the notion of human exceptionalism. Are we exceptional as human beings? And of course, the way that we answer that question has profound implications for the Christian faith, because Christianity teaches us that human beings are uniquely made in God's image, that we are the crown of creation, that we stand apart from all other creatures. And because we bear God's image, we're able to enter into a unique type of relationship with our creator that's ultimately mediated through the person of Jesus Christ. So this is a very important question uh, for those of us who hold to a Christian worldview. Now, this question is is prompted by a research paper published in Scientific Reports, which is uh, part of the Nature Family of Journals uh, last week. And in this paper, the research uh, researchers, which uh, consisted of a team of paleoanthropologists headed up by a researcher from Kenyon University in Ohio, and who was working in collaboration with a number of French scientists, claim to have discovered evidence at an archaeological site in southeastern France for string, a small piece of string that to them represented fiber technology. And on the basis of this discovery, they claim that not only did Neanderthals have fiber technology, but they had the cognitive abilities comparable to human beings, that they had the capacity for language, they had the capacity for mathematical analysis. So we're going to take a look at this discovery and what it means for the Christian worldview and the question of human exceptionalism in a moment. But before we do that, I would like to ask a favor of you for those of you who are watching either live or watching this as a recorded broadcast. Please take a moment and go to the comment section and check in. Let me know who you are and where you're watching from. This is incredibly valuable information for me to have as we plan future broadcasts, but also it's a great way for me to get to know you. I really want to know who is it that is watching these broadcasts. I want to develop a, a bit of a relationship with you, if you will, um, um, even if it is a virtual relationship. So. Uh, part of that process is you identifying yourself as a viewer of these sessions. So thank you for doing that. Also, uh, I would invite you to offer your thoughts on this discovery and the whole question of human exceptionalism in the comment section, even if your perspective differs from mine. I want to create an environment on my Facebook page, on the YouTube page where this will be posted also where people can engage in civil, high-level conversation about these very important issues, about who we are as human beings and where do we fit into the cosmos? What is our place in the cosmos? Uh, and then last but not least, if you have suggestions for uh, topics for future broadcasts or you have a question you'd like me to take on, please post it there in the comment section. I read through all the comments. Uh, even if I can't reply to every one of them, I read through all the comments. What you have to say is important to me. Okay, well, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, this question. Were Neanderthals the first hominins to produce strings? Were they the first hominins to develop fiber technology? 
And and maybe the the best way to tackle the those questions is to first of all take a look at the the scientific paper uh, that essentially uh, stimulated and prompted a number of science in the news articles uh, describing this discovery uh, just uh, within the last week or so. And when these popular science in the news articles came out, a number of you sent emails, not emails, but check that messages to me through Facebook or through Twitter, uh, asking me what I thought about this particular discovery. And so in response to those requests, we're going to, again, uh, take on this question about Neanderthals and uh, their capacity to produce fibers and hence their, their cognitive abilities. Now, this work was done by, again, a, a team of researchers that were primarily French scientists that were headed up by a, 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 an anthropologist who's at Kenyon University in Ohio. It's a relatively small school in northeastern Ohio, um, uh, not too far away from my old stomping grounds. And uh, this team of researchers were, were looking at a, a site, a cave site in southeastern uh, France uh, that uh, has had excavations performed on it uh, recently, beginning in 2006. And, and uh, people have continued to excavate this cave site since that point in time. And there's uh, five layers, five uh, units in this archaeological site that have been identified. The top three units, units one, two, and three, have very little by way of any kind of archaeological artifacts and are largely of, of, of limited interest to uh, the research community. But units four and five are where all the action is taking place because, uh, for example, in unit four, there's estimates of about 4,000 flakes that are found in that layer that are of the uh, uh, level wa uh, technology, which is the, the type of technology that uh, Neanderthals would have uh, produced. It's part of the Mousterian culture, if you will. Uh, there's also artifacts in unit five, but the focus uh, of this particular study was on uh, unit four and those artifacts. Now, uh, using uh, electron spin resonance techniques and uranium thorium, methods, uh, these two layers, uh, unit four and unit five, have been dated. Uh, unit four seems to range in dates from roughly four to four, sorry, 40,000 to 46,000 years ago. Uh, unit uh, five, about 90,000 years ago. So this would be in the heart of the Middle Paleolithic. And for those of you that are not familiar uh, with the window of time that the Middle Paleolithic refers to, it's roughly uh, uh, 300,000 years ago to about 50,000 years ago. And this would be the time where Neanderthals would have been prevalent in the Middle East, Europe, and in, and in Asia as well. So this is essentially uh, a Neanderthal site that these researchers were taking a look at. And as part of their routine practice, the researchers would perform a microscopic characterization of the flakes that they were recovering from these sites as they catalog them and then, per, you know, uh, uh, put them in, in, in uh, sealed containers to protect them from contamination and from damage. And in that process, they discovered one flake that was about um, 60 millimeters in size that um, had a small piece of what appeared to be string uh, uh, attached to it. And this small piece of a string-like material was about about six millimeters in length and about, uh, let's see here, uh, 0.5 millimeters wide. So uh, the flake would be roughly two inches in size with the string being roughly a quarter inch in length and, uh, let's see, about uh, a couple hundredths of an inch in diameter. So it's a very small piece of string that the researchers claim was attached to the inferior or the uh, underneath surface of the flake as they were excavating it. And they argue that this indicates that the string was either uh, buried contemporaneously with the flake or that it actually was buried prior to the flake being buried in that particular geological setting. Uh, they then used uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy to very carefully examine the morphology of this string-like structure. And through that examination, they noted that it appeared as if there were fibers that were twisted in a right-handed way 
to form what's called an S twist, and then three fibers that were twisted in a left handed way uh, to form what is called a Z twist. So there's an S twist and a Z twist that they noted in these fibers. And, and they argue that this looks like it has a three ply structure that has a morphology that's very similar to the morphology you would see in corresponding string fibers or string produced um, by contemporary techniques. Uh, so they argue that this looks as if this was an example of fiber technology. They then performed um, uh, an F.T. Rahman characterization of the fibers using F.T. Rahman microspectroscopy. And this measures vibrational modes in the organic materials in the sample. And they were able to detect vibrational bands that appear to have uh, that appear to arise from cellulose as well as some trace bands that look low level bands that looked like they would be derived from lignin. And, and this makes sense if these fibers were actually taken from tree bark. And in fact, examining the morphology of the fibers, they argue that it looks as if these fibers were actually taken from the inner bark of, uh, of, of pine, of a, of a pine tree. Uh, and the inner bark um, in certain times of the year would be soft. And so by scraping away or pounding away, you can actually release cellulosic fibers that they argued were the raw material to manufacture um, these string-like structures that they were characterizing. Now, something that was interesting about the, the F.T. Rahman analysis is that the bands that they detected were primarily cellulosic bands, again, with, with, with uh, bands that were clearly derived from lignin, but those bands were at relatively low levels. Now, in, cell, in, in, in cellulose, in, in tree materials, tree bark, uh, um, it, the chemical composition is roughly somewhere between 70 to 90 percent um, holocellulose, which would consist of hemocellulose as well as, as cellulose. Uh, and where, where the remainder of that, that um, um, material that would be part of the tree bark would be lignin, which would again be anywhere from 30 to 10 percent of the sample. Now, over time, because cellulose tends to degrade and lignin is very durable, Typically, in these ancient kind of fibers recovered from archaeological sites, you actually see uh, spectral data that would be the opposite of what they observed, where the lignum bands should dominate and the cellulose bands should be actually fairly uh, minimal in terms of spectral contributions. So they actually saw the opposite, which is a real oddity, uh, uh, which is an anomaly that, that I don't think they actually provide a good explanation for. Nevertheless, uh, what they, they did, again, is they discovered a small piece that would appear to be a string-like material that does show a three-ply structure uh, that the, the characterization, the chemical characterization through uh, F.T. Rahman microspectroscopy as well as the morphological characterization suggested that, the, that these fibers were derived from the, from the inner bark of, again, uh, pine trees. And this makes sense because there appear to be pine trees in that locale. And from a paleo, uh, paleontological standpoint, it looks as if they were, again, pine trees present at the time that the archaeological uh, deposits were laid down initially. Now, what these researchers do then is they argue that um, this is very clear evidence that Neanderthals had the capacity for fiber technology. And they argue that fiber technology is a foundational technology that leads to the ability to produce other types of technologicals, uh, technological um, uh, things, like, um, like uh, for example, bags and mats and nets and fabrics and uh, baskets and snares and, and even watercraft. And so they argue that, that this suggests that Neanderthals were able to produce technology that was far more sophisticated than we might be led to believe just based on the stone artifacts that we recover from Neanderthal sites. Uh, they also argued that this indicates that Neanderthals had advanced cognitive abilities because in order to weave uh, fibers, you would start with a fiber that you then would weave into a piece of yarn that you in 
turn would weave into a cord, and then you would weave the cords into a rope-like structure. And they argue that this process requires a, a, a capacity for mathematical relationships, but they also argue that this is the same kind of ability that would be required for language, because in language, you have words that are combined to form sentences, that are combined to form paragraphs, and that are combined to form stories. But what you have in language are these finite units that allow you to create that which is infinite, and they argue that fiber technology reflects the same thing. It's the finite that allows you then to create that which is infinite. Uh, and so they argue that this is evidence that Neanderthals had advanced cognitive ability that would be the type of ability required for language and for mathematical reasoning. And so on this basis, they argue that this discovery uh, uh, provides evidence that Neanderthals were exceptional, that Neanderthals were just like us as human beings, where the claim then would be that this would undermine the notion uh, of human exceptionalism and with it strike a blow to the, the biblical view of human nature and the image of God concept. Now, how then do I respond uh, from a Christian worldview perspective? And uh, my, my first point that I would like to make is that I'm not completely convinced that the, this work actually would lead us to the conclusions that these researchers have drawn. Now, I don't get me wrong. This work, in my view, is science at its very best, where the, the, the analytical work to characterize these materials associated with the flakes is meticulous. Uh, it's very high quality uh, work that, again, is science at its very best. My concern or my complaint is that I believe that these researchers have uh, produced an interpretation of the results that is unwarranted, that is, that is perhaps uh, uh, far outpacing what the actual data allows by way of interpretation. So let me um, uh, raise a couple of concerns. First is the dating of these layers. Now, uh, I, I think I'm, I accept, by and large, scientific methodology used to establish uh, the, the dating of the geological record and the fossil record associated with it. So I'm not a young earth creationist by way of expressing skepticism about certain dating techniques. But we do have to realize that there are dating techniques that perform better than others, that, that some dating techniques are, again, uh, error prone or, or have limitations to them. And this is true for the uranium-thorium dating technique and the electron spin resonance technique that were used to date these layers. Now, these are the techniques that would have been best useful, utilized uh, in the time regime that these uh, layers are. So you don't really have much of a choice but to use these methods. But we need to keep in mind that these methods are error prone and do have systematic errors associated with them that should give us some pause for thought about whether or not these dates are actually what are, are, are being uh, reported by the scientific community, that we should regard these dates with some measure of caution is my point. Uh, I'm not saying that they're incorrect. I mean, it is impressive that they uh, were using two separate distinct techniques uh, to, to, to date these layers, and that gives us greater confidence that the dates are valid. But just keep in mind that, again, these methods have limitations. But also, the, the part of the interpretation for this being a Neanderthal site is that the age of, the, of Unit 4 is a time window when Neanderthals would have been present in Europe and human beings, modern humans, would not have been. But the problem with this is that we have other studies that claim Neanderthals actually went extinct earlier than we thought, uh, and that modern humans made their way into Europe earlier than we thought. And so when we're looking at a date of 40 to 46,000 years ago, this is at the, that window of time where you're seeing a transition where Neanderthals are disappearing and humans are now appearing in Europe. And it could very well be that that window of time actually uh, re represents a time window that... that uh, occurs after Neanderthals have already gone extinct and after the time that humans made their way into Europe. And so therefore, you could argue that this very well could actually be a human site, not necessarily a Neanderthal site. So I don't think you can actually rule out that this was, was a Neanderthal site and not 
a, a modern human site. Now, the, the type of flakes that you see there seem to suggest it was a Neander Neanderthal site, but again, you can't rule that out or that you can't rule out that this was a site occupied by both Neanderthals and by modern humans uh, in a very close window of time, and that the fibers that you see there in the site could actually be the product of, of human activity, modern human activity, not the activity of Neanderthals. Okay, um, and then uh, another point of concern is the chemical anomaly of this particular uh, fiber. Uh, it's not the chemical composition that you would expect, which should be dominated by lignin uh, with cellulose being a relatively minor component. Because even though as a fresh sample, cellulosic bands would dominate and lignin bands would be minor components, over time, because cellulose degrades and lignin is notorious for being resistant to degradation, but you would expect that the spectra would look different than it actually looks. And this, to me, again, raises questions about the interpretation that these anthropologists bring to bear. On top of that, this sample seems to be an outlier because they report the recovery of a number of fiber samples from this site. Uh, but this is the only one of the fiber samples that they uh, recovered that actually shows what they interpret to be a three-ply structure. And so I just wonder, given that this is an, an outlier and is not characteristic of the other, other fiber samples, if this was just simply something that, that by accidental happenstance wound up to have a morphology that seems to resemble a, uh, a three-ply structure when in fact it wasn't, uh, it wasn't weaved together into a, a cord-like structure through deliberate activity. This is a very small piece of, of fiber or string, quote unquote, that was recovered from this site. Again, that seems to be a, a, an outlier. It seems to be unique. Uh, and so on that basis alone, I think one would, would be cautious about drawing this really strong conclusion that Neanderthals actually had fiber technology and were engaged in activities that uh, resemble those activities that would be necessary for uh, supportive mathematical reasoning and language capacity. Now, one uh, also one point that I would like to make that I think to me is most devastating to the conclusions that are being drawn here is that these researchers are drawing their their conclusions from the the archaeological record exclusively, but they're ignoring other sets of data that bear on the question of Neanderthal cognitive ability. So, for example. Uh, we know from comparative brain studies that Neanderthals had a very different type of brain structure than that of modern humans. Uh, that, that Neanderthals had a brain size that was slightly larger than ours, uh, but when you factor in their body mass and, and calculate the encephalization quotient, which is brain size to body mass ratio, uh, modern humans actually had a slightly higher encephalization quotient than Neanderthals. But more importantly, Neanderthals had an elongated skull, whereas modern humans have a globular skull. And the difference that makes is profound because it allows for an expansion of a number of different regions of the brain, like the parietal lobe, that are critical for mathematical reasoning, for language. They are critical for establishing the hand-eye coordination that you would need to produce art, to, to produce uh, um, uh, symbolic artifacts, uh, as well as to do things like weaving fibers together into uh, rope-like or string-like structures. And so the, the, the point here is that there's other data that gives us insight into uh, the neurobiology of Neanderthals that seems to suggest that they lack the capacity for symbolism. And it's important to note that there's no evidence that we have conclusively at any Neanderthal site that shows that they had symbolic capabilities. If we saw those symbolic, that, that evidence for symbolism at these sites, then maybe it would be legitimate to interpret the fibers as actually fiber technology. Or if we had reason to think that Neanderthals, based on their brain structure, had the cognitive ability to produce fiber technology, then that would be a legitimate conclusion. So to me, the fact that this looks like an outlier, the fact that it is uh, chemically anomalous, 
suggests that that the, the conclusion that Neanderthals, again, were on par with us in terms of their cognitive ability is an unjustified conclusion. And uh, and so on that basis alone, I'm not convinced that that conclusion is valid. Now, there's something else that's going on here that I'm a little reticent to bring up, but I think it's, this is an important point, is that there are a, a, a cadre of, of a paleoanthropologists who are anti-human exceptionalism, that, that they, they find this concept of human exceptionalism to be highly distasteful. And one way to, to counter the claims that humans are exceptional is to try to elevate Neanderthals to our level in terms of their cognitive ability. Because again, if Neanderthals were exceptional too, then it means that human beings are not unique, that we can't argue that we are exceptional. And so there is a strong motivation on the part of a, of a cadre of, of, of paleoanthropologists to interpret the archaeological record in such a way that they try to, to claim Neanderthals, again, had cognitive abilities like us. But there's a number of other paleoanthropologists who are open-minded, who are fair, who look at the evidence as it's presented at face value and critically. And for many of these anthropologists, they would argue that Neanderthals were remarkable creatures, to be certain, but they were cognitively inferior to humans. They lacked the capacity for symbolism. They lack the capacity for language, uh, th and and that that this these are features and capabilities that are only found in anatomically and behaviorally modern humans, human beings like me and like you. And so they would actually favor the idea of human exceptionalism based on what the archaeological record seems to consistently s state, and that the claims that Neanderthals made art, that they they made jewelry that they buried their dead ritually, that they mastered fire, that they made use of medicinal plants, that they made fiber, that they uh, were able to um, um, uh, carry out all of these different activities that are claimed that they were capable of doing are all claims that, again, are in the scientific literature, to be fair, but these claims fail to withstand ongoing scientific scrutiny. These claims generate a lot of interest in the popular media, and, and are uh, reported to an uh, over-exaggerated extent. But there are all kinds of papers in the scientific literature uh, that indicate that Neanderthals, again, lacked cognitive ability, that they were cognitively inferior to us, and a, a number of studies that actually refute all of these claims that are used to bolster Neanderthal exceptionalism. So in my mind, the most fair, balanced, an honest reading of the archaeological record in conjunction with the comparative brain studies uh, and uh, suggest to me that Neanderthals, again, were not anywhere like us, that only human beings, again, have the capacity for symbolism, have the capacity for open-ended generative manipulation of symbols, have the capacity for uh, theory of mind, and have a capacity for forming complex hierarchical social structures. And that these, in my view, are all scientific descriptors of what we as Christians would understand as the image of God. And so Neanderthals were not like us, uh, that the claims of Neanderthal exceptionalism don't stand, including this claim, in my view, and, uh, and, and therefore don't represent a, a challenge to the biblical concept of, of human nature and the image of God. So I'm going to go ahead and bring things to a close, thanking you for uh, watching this broadcast. And again, I would remind you, please take a moment, check in, let me know who you are, where you're watching from. Also, uh, I would ask that you uh, uh, leave your comments and your thoughts about this discovery in the comment section. I want to hear your perspective and don't hesitate to suggest topics for future broadcasts. Until next time, I want to leave you with this final thought. And that is this, the more that we know about science, the more that we have reasons to believe. God bless you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Until next time.